Tatiana Bazzichelli, curator of Transmediale Festival, and I'm really happy to be here to announce this great panel really participated. You can see we have already many people on stage and there will be also one more that will join us. And uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank uh, the Friedrich Herbert Stiftung and the Goethe Institute in San Paolo for their support and also uh, I would like to say that this panel has been done in collaboration with the Post Media Lab at the Center for Digi Digital Culture at the Lefana University of Lüneburg and also was uh, uh, organized in collaboration with the studies group Mundo M Rede at the postgraduate program in technology and digital media of uh, the University PUC PUC of Sao Paulo. And, uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, there have been much more also collaboration and friendship to create this panel uh, because I would like to say a bit the history of it. I mean, uh, last year at Transmediale we have, uh, had the panel together with uh, uh, Clemens uh, Aprich uh, and uh, also Oliver Lerone Schulz uh, that was uh, uh, named Remixing Digital Cities and inside this panel uh, we had the presence of Felipe Fonseca <clears throat> and Felipe was also supposed to be here today but unfortunately this didn't happen but he has been also a key person in managing and uh, helping us to get uh, all together and the same also Georgia Nicolau that has been working with me for one year uh, for the resource uh, program and uh, I really would like to thank a lot both uh, Philippe and Georgia because they have been really key people uh, to bring uh, all us together. At the same time also last uh, year I went uh, to Brazil also supported by the Goethe Institute for a travel uh, research travel and uh, Oliver and Clemens also went there during the Tropixel Festival and uh, I think that this is a panel that also was completely born by a lot of collaboration among us and also a lot of friendship and uh, so I really think that uh, has been kind of uh, fun also to give, uh, you know, uh, to reach this point, a lot of uh, intense communication by email, uh, even the participants wanted to decide their running order as part, you know, of self-determination of Brazilian <laughs> uh, perspective, I think that was really great to see. And I uh, just uh, would like to thank you all to be here and uh, I would like to introduce also a bit more deeply Oliver since he has to introduce a lot of people, I think he deserves also to have a proper introduction. And uh, Oliver uh, is also my colleague at the Lofana University of Lüneburg, uh, is uh, working at the Post Media Lab, actually he has been one of the co-founder together with uh, uh, Clemens Aprich and uh, <clears throat> the Post Media Lab is part of the Center for Digital Culture of the Lufana University of Lüneburg and uh, his expertise ha has always been um, related to network building in the context of new media culture but also pretty political so uh, the Post Media Lab has been a partner of the resource we have been really working together for two years now, it has been a great collaboration, I really enjoy to work with you Oliver and Clemens and at the moment so both of them um, uh, will be involved in the uh, Making Change project inside the Common Media Lab and so they are going to work on collective vision and social change in globalized society and the media spheres. So now Oliver I leave the word to you then you can introduce the great people that we we have with us today, so thanks a lot. And thank you, Tatjana and uh, Christopher also for giving us this opportunity in, even in the auditorium with this uh, panel that I'm really happy um, to see that we m could make it happen because it took some, some effort and it's uh, kind of the instanti instantiation of I think collaborations and discussions on very different various levels uh, which I think makes this discussion even more valuable than an ordinary panel often is. Um, 
this is also a reason why I'm going to be a little bit uh, out of step maybe with, with uh, normal panel protocols. I'm not going to give you a list of who is who and has been where, uh, because I think uh, the panelists will introduce themselves very much with, with the topics and the presentations, which are going to take some of your attention anyway, uh, because we, we asked uh, of the audience to attend uh, like uh, four presentations which uh, will span over 20 minutes. We will try to keep this in time, but we will also uh, try to kind of give the place really to, to the Brazilian perspective here. Um, so, welcome. I think it's also part of the protocol to, to make the connection to the afterglow, as all the panels here on this stage do. So, welcome to this afterglow. Um, I think you, you can experience it. We have been through f four days of a very intense, uh, various discussion. And uh, a normal trait of the afterglow is that at the end, kind of the crowd of most interested hardcore people gather around the ashes and um, kind of continue the discussion. I think this is the situation we are in here also. There has been a lot of parties, a lot of discussions. Um, so I'm very uh, happy that uh, a lot of you in broad daylight on Sunday at 12, made it to this cave uh, to follow the afterglow of, uh, of some uh, of our discussions. Um, we, we have decided uh, that it's worthwhile, which also connects to the idea of afterglow, to have this panel on Brazil in particular. And of course you can debate these kind of settings where you, where you feature a country as uh, kind of having, having this common frame of reference, but um, we, we probably will also discuss that, but um, it has to be said that this panel also is an afterglow of the official institutional uh, two-way exchange that happened in 2013 around the uh, Brazilian-German year, which also brought some of us uh, on state tickets, uh, first time for me, uh, to, to Brazil and uh, brought us this opportunity to pick up some threads. We, we want to try to keep this uh, discourse and exchange going beyond the institutional frameworks. So in this way, this panel also constitutes an afterglow. Um, and of course, uh, like with the Brazilian context, which I'm the least familiar with probably in this room, uh, at least on the panel, um, th there are some uh, interesting features for people who are interested in post-media cultures, post-digital cultures, media activism, or however you, you label your own position. Um, because uh, Brazil, as you might have seen uh, in the Anthropocene exhibition, has uh, a specific place, uh, of course, like, like every context. Um, in the, if you have been to the Anthropocene exhibition, you have seen might have seen a video which shows uh, the construction of Brasilia uh, right between uh, a slide of the non-alignment movement and just before the global atmospherics uh, measurement projects. So Brazil is somewhere in between a very peculiar historical position with uh, the with non-alignment culture, but uh, has from very early on, beginning 20th century at least, been part of the project of modernity itself. So it's, it's not really outside of, uh, of the framework that we, uh, as, uh, of course, as uh, European scholars, researchers, activists uh, are situated in, um, which is only one way to make the connection. Um, we had some discussion before, like Tatiana mentioned. Uh, one was on the, which is kind of in, in synchronicity with the project of uh, Br Brasilia, uh, the, uh, of course, of, out of Brazil and out of the discussions there, which are now labeled post-colonial, um, came this concept of anthropophagia um, in the beginning of the 20th century, which of course also is a topos which is kind of naming, a, having a political take on the afterglow of modernity, like kind of a re, uh, re-digesting of, of modernity with a critical take on it. Um, so, uh, as, as we learned through the emails, and that already has been some achievement, uh, this actually was kind of an import, cultural import also from a discussion between uh, Brazil and France at that time. I don't know uh, whether Marcus will go into that, but we might discuss that. Um, so, 
this is one way, like in the bigger historical framework, to to locate this in 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 a context of afterglow. Another one, a more contemporary one, is the afterglows we see at the moment, which is, uh, of course, uh, also one reason why why the exchange here between Brazil and Germany happened. Brazil has been one of the later emergences in this context of BRIC countries and of the old uh, paradigm of uh, developed the development capitalism and has been very successful on some measures uh, in that. You have the uh, situation which I, I'm sure many people here are aware and follow with the PT, PT government and this kind of outgrowth of social democratic projects in, 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 in the Brazilian context, but also the disillusionment with that uh, and uh, what you could maybe or some people here call ghost modernity uh, or kind of political ghost modernity maybe. And um, we now see and we can follow this in the news also, like the current spectacles of post-development capitalism or however you want to call this new global totality around the Olympics and the World Cup, um, the movements that happened in Brazil that uh, caught a lot of attention here, um, uh, which, which is in contrast to what Tatiana mentioned and what we discussed last year with Felipe Fonseca, who we all miss uh, on this panel, um, about smart cities and this idea that um, the digital development potential of capitalism can bring this kind of cybernetic, post-cybernetic uh, smart city intelligence uh, framework to Rio and everything will be fine. Um, so I, I, I would see this panel also in line with, with a... Uh, with a statement that was done on another panel here in the auditorium which linked the idea of post-digital, and you can argue what that is, but uh, I think it's interesting to link the idea of the post-digital with the notion of the post-democratic. Um, and I think there, there are interesting ways to relate that and I think this contrast between the IBM Rio de Janeiro Smart City project and the movements on the street are pretty much an illustration of, of this uh, interesting tension. Um, so, what this panel is, is uh, a window on uh, existing context of exchange, activism, uh, research, the theory, political theory, and um, as Tatiana said, uh, I'm the one person missing here is Felipe Fonseca, because I met everybody on this panel uh, at Tropixel, which was happening for the first time uh, just on on the outskirts uh, of uh, Sao Paulo. It's, it's actually a, a, a autonomous city uh, on, on, on the Atlantics, but when I was in Sao Paulo, the people from Sao Paulo would say, oh, it's the nicest beach of Sao Paulo, it's just four hours away. Um, which also gives you an idea that, that reference frames uh, are a little bit uh, different in, in different uh, geographical contexts. Um, but this Tropixel Festival, which is trying to insert a longer term project of critical development or critique of development also from a post-media perspective, has been started by Philippe and uh, this is also part of, of this discussion and I, I hope we're going to continue that. Um, so what we're going to do uh, in particular is we will go from techno shamanism on your left with with Fabi right to the multitude and even art uh, with Lucas Bambosi um, in between uh, Adriano uh, Belisario will uh, talk about a project called who owns Brazil which is also an interesting correspondence with a, a German based project who owns the world I don't know whether we we might go into discussion with that um, and Marcos uh, Bastos will be third um, to also talk about the multitude. We just positioned him uh, between Fabi and Adriano because what this panel also is, I think, is uh, an attempt of uh, translating uh, political concepts and ontologies. And this is at least part of our interest as Post Media Lab. Um, so besides concepts, and there, there was the discussion about a uh, stacks. I think this is like a stack of theory we're going to be presented of a very different also approaches. So it's not about coherence necessarily, um, but it's uh, about translating a context of discussion and engagement activity uh, from Brazil with, uh, with a, a European one maybe, uh, German, I don't know. Um, 
And part of this translation is the translation of language, of course. Uh, so as uh, Fabi was so brave to, uh, to actually um, uh, give in and, and speak in English for us, um, we have to thank her especially for that. Um, we, we also have to, to, to thank uh, Mark, Marcus for uh, giving a helping hand at, at times maybe in, in doing additional translation. Um, so. As has been said, there is a stack also of questions that, that have been pre-discussed. We might in reintroduce them in the discussion, which is actually going to be started off by someone from the audience who choose to be in the part of the audience, so part of you, which is Carla Brunet, who uh, is going to wrap up the four presentations to, to uh, fill in some missing links. Of course, not all of them, but um, to give some, some more context, and we are thankful for that. So we're going to start this uh, kind of mosaic take on oppositional modes of subjectivity with uh, Fabi Borges and we are all kind of curious whether she actually is going to tell us what techno-shamanism is or just does something else. We, we'll see. Okay, good morning. Thank you for your come. Uh, my English is a bit like a, a bad, but I will try to be clear. And my subject is uh, techno-shamanism. Uh, many people have some idea about what it means. Is some, sometimes can I walk a little bit, like when I move my, my, my thought? Okay. Um, techno-shamanism, uh, it's something between science and religion or uh, technology and the ancestral, ancestral um, culture. This is more or less what we understand when we talk about, uh, when we tell this word. And um, uh, I, I, I want to, to start uh, showing that like a problem and a challenge, not giving the answer. Because this answer is not, um, it's, it's not ready. Uh, we are very far away of this moment where we could put it together, science and uh, cosmic vision or spirituality or uh, subjectivity of matter or, well, we can work with so many concepts to talk about uh, this union. But I think we are very far away from it. But I will give you some intuitions and ideas about what it means. But I start with a tragedy. And I want to show, uh, to, to, to show you a group of uh, indigenous uh, community. Okay. They live, here, they live here in Dourados, uh, just where uh, the, the, point, the point is. The name of them are, are Kaiowa, Kaiowa, uh, Guarani Kaiowa and Nyandeva. It's, uh, I took them uh, for example, to bring for example of this tragedy, because they are the, the most um, agredido. Huh? Pro yeah, att attacked uh, people right now. They are losing their earth and their world since the uh, século XIV, 14th century. But now it's, um, well, the problem keeps going and looks like they are the, the meanings of this indigenous tragedy the, uh, in Brazil. Yeah, they are like. Um, in a very bad moment, and it is interesting to see it like um, this is exactly the fight between the, the forces of um, commercialization and uh, well, capitalization and uh, technologization of uh, a place where it has so many forests. Not, not anymore, yeah. And uh, these people, these indigenous Guarani Kaiowa, like poor, lazy, ugly, 
uh, vagabond, uh, strange, not adapted of the system. So this is a um, uh, uh, what I, I, I came there. So I went there in 2008 because was happened a suicide epidemic. And uh, I don't, uh, I'm not sure about this word, epidemic, but I will use that because we will talk about shawara, and shawara means epidemic as well. So I think it's, it's nice to keep the idea about uh, epidemic suicide. So it's a community of 2,000 two people, 2,000? 12,000 people, and the, the suicides was like uh, 56 per year, and 56 and 60. For a community, for 12,000 people, it's really, really big, yeah? And uh, it's not a normal suicide, it's a Jejuvi suicide. I write a, t a text about you with Verini de Pereira when we went there. Uh, it's online in some, in, on the internet. The name is Jejuvi, the word... The re Recuperated. And Jeju V is a Swiss, uh, ritualistic suicide, suicide because um, they suffocate. I will show for you. There is this movie. This is a brilliant movie. Uh, the name is Bird Watchers. I think everybody could see it because it's a good movie. And uh, it is, I just took this part where they, they show the Jeju V. This is the most, most normal scene uh, there on the, with the Kaiowa Guarani. But why they do that? It is because, ah, they are indigenous Kaiowa Guarani. I, I met some of them there. And why they suffocate? Uh, Como é que se diz? Hanging. Hanging? Hang. Hang. Because for, uh, for Guarani Kaiowa, the word is the soul. If he, this word cannot be expressed, if this word cannot be showed, have no sense, uh, you, 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 you need to suffocate it because possibly it come back in other time. Uh, don't forget the name of the movie is Bird Watchers. I just want to say one thing more. The word and the world. Word and world. This is, these two things the Jeju Vikaiwa are losing. And this is the tragedy of them. And um, I want to, to uh, maybe I took too much time with the, the, this. Um, but uh, I just want to make it clear uh, how the tragedy is uh, th this fight about which life we want, which kind of world we want. It is going on uh, with, um, um, in different ways around the world, but with these indigenous people are in a moment uh, so liminar, yeah? liminar? in the board. Uh, they are, of course, losing all these desserts. So I want to talk a little bit uh, uh, to, to show. <clears throat> they did the immense campaign because they said, they put on the internet, this Kaiowa Guarani, if uh, the government don't give back on, on their artists, exactly now they will all kill themselves, they will die. On the in, on the this this earth, and then it became a huge movement of the website uh, web network um, in Brazil, and many 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 people from the Facebook, Twitter, uh, all, all the other red the webs changed their names for Kaioa Guarani. So. I, I change as well, I don't know if someone changed here, but millions of people, so we were, everybody was Guarani Kaiowa. And this was a strange campaign because we never saw uh, so many, like... Uh, okay. So many people helping, what did you do? 
<laughs> so many people um, apoiando, giving support to Guarani Kaiowa. That ugly, dirty, vagabond. I want you to take your, these words because it will be important for us. Hippie, losers. So, o oh, Brasil made this big campaign. Um, all the manifestation was saying, we are all Guarani Kaiowa. Uh, many things on the internet. Well, but this, the, the funny thing is, it didn't, happy, it didn't help. It didn't change anything. And uh, for the worst, uh, pior ainda, and the worst is this guy who was a big leader and who was the protagonist, principal protagonist of this movie, Bird Watchers. Just after the movie, he got uh, famous, a little bit more famous, and success, and he did this. Uh, ah, <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> I, I start with first point yet. <laughs> okay, he was assassinated because he started to be strong. Everybody saw this movie, all the campaign in Brazil, a, a, a favor, supporting uh, Kaiowa Guarani. So they just killed Ambrosio Guarani Kaiowa. You see how deep Brazil are in these in these places like Mato Grosso, where I show for you. Okay, and then I will change very fast for Aldeia Maracanã, and Aldeia Maracanã is Rio de Janeiro. I will be very fast with that because really it's not my point. But just for show for you, right next is started this revolution between indigenous and the state and Copa of, uh, Co of World Cups in Brazil because these indigenous peoples, they have a place you will laugh, but you know this Maracanã, Maracanã stage is like, th this is the idea, what Maracanã will be in the World Cup. And this, where the point red, is where live these indigenous people. So, of course, dirty, ugly, Vagabond, losers, don't working. So they are there. Imagine um, this beautiful place with these this dirty people from everywhere. Uh, of course, they will take them out. I will not uh, take much time with um, Rio de Janeiro because Adriano will talk about that. But I want to go straight away to Yanomami peoples. Yanomami peoples is a community here, I'll show for you. Just their, their, their space is bigger than Holland, yeah. Netherlands? Holland? Ne Netherlands. Netherlands. Uh, this community, indigenous community, is bigger than Netherlands. It's twice bigger, and it's incredible because it's like uh, no much uh, families, like, um, but it's a preservation area. And they, um, um, they are, they, Shawara is a kind of entity of them, and um, it means the smoke of the metal, because this area is so rich of uh, gold, precious metals, and then people just go there to take it and make minering, I think. Miner um, garimpo. Prospect. Gold mining. And then people go, it's not, uh, it's forbidden, the, the government doesn't permit that, but it's too much earth and people cannot uh, just stay there. And what's happened? they are dying as well. The tragedy of uh, Yanomami and Guarani, it's so different. They don't, Guarani don't have earth. The Yanomami have so many earth, and they are dying because the smoke of the, the, the gold is coming and uh, entering the air and taking their lives. And then they have a prophecy about that. They say, you know why the sky 
is still is there because it still exists shamans. But when the forest starts to fall on down, the shamans start dying. And uh, if he, the shamans die, the auxiliary spirits will not keep the sky. And the sky will, will follow from the earth. And the earth will not support that because you are taking all the gold inside this. You are taking the skeleton of the earth. You are taking its structure. So when the sky could die, it will open and all the white and uh, black and indigenous and the yellows and everybody will uh, be in sight of it. Like it happened before and will happen again. Just for a question, for we think, how many times these indigenous are talking about? Why they, how they say it happened before? Just a little question. Um, so, just for going to my... 20 minutes is nothing. Uh, please, I want to talk more. Uh, prophecy of the end of the world. So, this prophecy is interesting because they say, you know why white people don't listen what I'm saying? What we are saying? Because they cannot dream. The white people will sleep, but they cannot dream. Well, I cannot finish my conference. Uh, I will show a little movie, just showing uh, this, this idea about what is... No, I have no time to talk about tech shamanism. Just this legend about the end of the world. Can you put the, the, the sound? The, yes, just the images and then I, I finish with the idea of perspectivism. I have to say that for you because perspectivism is like this. Um, before these indigenous people, uh, white people, and I'm including myself in that, and Brazilian society as well. I'm not talking about Brazil and uh, are not white. Uh, but white people has this sense about indigenous. They are a kind of ancestors, and we probably were like that before. But in the perspective of these indigenous and Yanomams, these shamans, it's a meeting of shamans, they, they don't think like that. They think, well, you know that white people, we were like that before. But then we and the nature, we just separate of it because it is an um, enemy of the, the, our style of life. And these uh, is two concepts I would like to show. It's the perspectivism. It's the difference between anthropocentrism and anthropomorphism in the indigenous perspective. Uh, the, in, the, base, the base is human. Yeah, the base, everything exists, every matter, every moon, every flower, animals, everything is a woman. Human? Okay? What change is not the culture, uh, uh, because the culture is the unique one, just one culture. Everybody is human. The nature change. Um, the nature is a kind of... Um, style or perspective. So for them, um, they, they have this horizontality, this perspective um, conceptualization is from Viveiros de Castro, who did this Amerindios universal um, theory, and I am trying to explain very fast for you what it means, because uh, if you see these indigenous, like always with someone who has no technology, uh, it is not your contemporary, it's, they are just lucky because they exist yet, and they probably, they are very, very, very ignorant. Well, I think 
on the in, on the way of perspectivism says you are wrong. There is three things very important in the in their technologies. First, they know to uh, connect with um, biodiversity. Uh, two, they have uh, a ca ability to cross uh, points of view very different. And three, they don't have um, this feeling about uh, superiority of, of the other things exist. Three things we could bring to our hack lab if we could do a, a techno shamanism here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to take up some of the threads later in the discussion and we have to thank Fabi twice because from what I don't know her too well, but from what I heard, this is very brave that she just stops now. So, <laughs> Adriano, you, you're to follow. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, as Oliver said, my, my name is Adriano Belisario and first I would like to thank for the Transmediale staff for inviting us to be here. And I've been working with media and technology since 2003, and more recently since 2010. I've been working on different projects concerning the impacts of okay, okay, of the mega events on on Rio. And I live in Rio de Janeiro. And my plan for today's speech is to briefly present this project called Who Owns Brazil and talk about the insurgent movements that are happening in Rio and how they are related to some subjects that were proposed for this panel today. And Who Owns Brazil is a campaign developed for, by the More Democracy Institute and a cooperative called ETA, which means Education, Information and Technology for Self-Management. And it was made possible thanks to more than 800 supporters that contributed to our crowdfunding. And basically our main goal is to map the economic power in, in Brazil and its relationship with the government. And so we created an online platform where anyone can easily search for a company, a, a person, or government agencies, and to visualize their relationship networks in the stock exchange markets, uh, political campaign financing, and money received from, from, uh, from the government. And we also developed this plugin for WordPress to help other people in other countries to, to, who want to map data about the economic power. And I want to show you an example of one of these networks. Uh, here we have an example of a network uh, of power of a Brazilian director called Walter Salles which is, is one of the owners of a big bank in Brazil. And here we have a print screen of his profile where you can see his relationship of control in different companies. And he used the data about from the stock exchange to present networks like this, making it easier to visualize <coughs> the information about uh, the relationship between different, different entities, uh, which can be persons, companies, or government agents. And these entities are the nodes on the graph, and the links are the percentage of control, of ownership between them. And the red line is, indicates a percentage, a percentage of control high under higher than 50%, so he controls totally the, the company. And <clears throat> it's a very simple case of chain 
uh, of control because usually these networks are much more complex and I will show you one of that. This one is a network of the, the National Development Bank in Brazil, which is a federal public company that in, that in 2011, 2011 lent money to big companies double the World Bank investments. So it's a really big public bank. And we, ha we have thousands of networks like this. So to deal with the complexity of these networks, we created an index to measure the, the concentration of economic power in the stock exchange markets. And basically, it's a way to, of deducing control through the shares on the stock ex exchange. And using this index, we have done a ranking of the biggest private companies in Brazil, considering not only their net income, but also their participation and control in the stock exchange market. And we found that the universe of publicly traded companies in our ranking are responsible for almost 52% of the Brazilian gross domestic product. And it is... Okay. And, and we also found that the first 12 companies in, the, in our ranking hold more economic power than all of the others combined. So we can say that almost 25% uh, <coughs> of your GDP is controlled by only 12 companies, which is very, uh, a very concentration of economic power. And I will close the, this video to... Okay. No, it's because it was blocking part of the... So, and all data that we used was, uh, on this project was already available, but not cross-checked. And uh, uh, this all data about the campaign financing, the stock exchange, the National Development Bank, and other government repass that we used as source for this platform was, av uh, was already available, but not cross-checked. So, although it can be considered an open data project, in Juan's Brazil, we criticize some approaches to, the, to this concept of open data, especially those uh, based only in, on the imperative notion that the government should be open. And, of course, we believe that transparency and participation are fundamental in a democracy, but uh, only the openness of data is not enough. Uh, we must face open data not like an end into, into itself, but as a tool to improve the resistance and the other actions from the civil society, of the civil society. And we also need to keep in mind that the government openness is also a necess necessity uh, for the financial capital, uh, for the management of resources on a global scale. And what we have to work towards Juan's Brazil is the necessity of, for more transparency for corporations too. Uh, because we think that without it, we, we won't be able to really understand the real dynamics of power in the world today. And one thing that we realize in this research is that it's impossible to completely understand how this economic power is organized only nationally. Uh, since the financial capital is, organ is structured globally, we also need a global mapping efforts to, to try to understand how these networks of uh, the economic powers operate. And one, one of the more famous slogans of the Occupy movement was just, we are the 99%. And, but 
what do we really know uh, about the, the top 1% of the economy? And we know almost nothing about them. And it's explained in part by the lack of uh, transparency uh, about the economic power and the whole of black box like tax havens. But in, on the other hand, it's already possible to perform a lot of actions with the public information already available. Um, for instance, we did this, the methodology of Homes Brazil, based on the research and the network of global corporate control, which was made in Switzerland. And it's a very interesting study. And this article presented an investigation into the ownership networks of transnational, corpor uh, transnational corporations, and they did it based on the science of complexity applied to the economic uh, economy field. And their analysis basically wants to answer a simple question, which is who controls the world, uh, the world, who controls the economy of the world, and they use it. Uh, there is the link to, if you want to read the, this research, okay. and they use a database of more than 40,000 transnational corporations to show us uh, how 737 companies accumulate 8% of the control over the value of all other corporations. And here we have a visualization of these networks in the left. A general overview of the relationship between the transnational corporations and the right. Uh, we have a visualization of the core of uh, that hold more economic power, and we can see it's basically financial institution uh, that operates very interconnected. And so, looking for this this data available. Uh, we can say that when we question about who owns the world or who controls the economy, uh, thinking in terms of the opposition between 1% and 99% can be even seen as an optimistic uh, point of view about the concentration of power. Uh, so when we talk about colonialism today, I, I think that it's impossible to not think in the role of, of the big corporations and these financial institutions. Uh, I think that we are living like a new kind of colonization produced by these entities, and this kind of colonization, of course, does not replace the national colonization, which still exists. Um, but uh, actually, this corporate colonization has been carrying out many times with the support of the states. And in the case of Rio, we can see we can see it clearly in the in the process related to the so-called mega events, which is made by the partnership between the state and private companies, and it brings a management logic of a city of the city focused on attracting investments. So Rio, Rio de Janeiro has been operating uh, like a huge, uh, as a huge laboratory of an idea of a city as a business, uh, where if you are not a, a stakeholder or if you are not a consumer, there is no place for you in the city, like the people in Aldeia Maracanã. There is no place for Aldeia Maracanã beside the new Maracanã that they are developing. And because of this, we have been witness to an accelerated process of human rights infractions and gentrification in the city, as well as the use of government money to improve pub public installations that will be then given to, to these companies. And for, for instance, only in Rio, there was 65,000 people removed from their houses for preparation works for the mega events. And we, in this map, we can see, we can see the city, and here, 
here we have the C, right? And the pink circles uh, indicate communities with evictions. And the yellow dots, the yellow house up, and the place where those families were reallocated. And I think this map shows clearly uh, that the forced evictions, uh, the, one of the goals of this kind of concept of a city as a business is to is remove the poor people from the valued areas. So we can see that the areas near from the sea, near from the, the beach, and uh, the people are, are being reallocated to, to the countryside. And so we have this, this situation of the city, a laboratory of the city as a business, but at the same time, uh, the city has been turning also into a laboratory of resistance. Oh. <laughs> and I think it, well, I will run to, to, because I want to show a video at the end of my presentation. And, but, I think that it was impossible to end, even for the more optimistic, uh, to predict what we, we saw in Brazil last year. And when we had one, one million of people complaining in the streets, in a city with six million of habitants, I think there, there is some important thing happening there. And, but what, I think that one interesting question is how do we pass from this, the micropolitics actions to these big uprisings? And of course, I, I, I don't have the final answer for this question, but there are some aspects to highlight. And first, the riots obvious, obviously uh, did not begin with thousands of people. Uh, they started with a few people with a calendar of protests causing regular interventions in the public space to affect the normal operation of the city. So we can think in, in the city as a system and the act of closing a street, for instance, as a way to intervene in this system. And we also have the whole of the independent media, video streaming, and the movement had a very clear and objective goal, which was, in the case, the reduction of the transport tax. Um, so, at the same time, the people were actually on the street for different reasons. And these protests were a convergence between many historic struggles of the social movements and also people who were not part of these traditional movements, but felt themselves contaminated by this call to take the streets and by this emotional state of insurgence. So from this perspective, the insurgence of the city seems to be more related to a collective emotional state than a public crisis in the economy or in the traditional political institutions. So uh, I, will, I, I, will, I would like to talk about uh, one of the most, one of the phrases most, most commonly heard on the street, which was non weiter copa, but I think that I, I, I do not have much time. Okay, three minutes. And so I will finish my presentation show uh, uh, playing a video. It is a, a video made by a collective from Porto Alegre called Tatu Morto. É, é, exactly. Uh, não vai ter Copa means there won't be a World Cup. And it, it is a very clear provocation to this partnership between state and companies and many people of the government and the even left thinkers were really scared with the image of thousands of people screaming that we want to be a World Cup. But I don't think that this kind of, uh, this phrase should be interpreted, should be taken literally even, because it, I think it would be necessary an army to really stop the World Cup. It, it, I think that it means that there will not be the World Cup that gov the government and the companies was expecting. 
and there will be another World Cup. And I think that the video will help us to visualize this. So there is my contacts, Twitter, mail, blah, blah, blah. And I want to show the video. It's not, it's a video clip, very short. Just a minute. Assim pra convencer. Então, mais uma vez, nós somos um traído pelo Estado Nacional. Esse teu papo de querer crescer. Na parteria, jogo aberto. Thank you, Adriano, and uh, thanks already for introducing like two 
different perspectives on the very same situation. I just got the idea I make a proposal to the Transmediale, seeing that was one insight for me. Uh, there should be a project, I remembered Trevor Paklan's images of these incredible special operation forces units and how to deconstruct them and read them. I think this should be linked to uh, read those labels for these new campaigns on whatever global spectacles. It's, it's very interesting to see as part of the same kind of operational uh, system. Markus, you might pick up here with the multitude. So, first I want to thank Tatiana, Christopher, and all the Transmediality team for the invitation, also for being so welcoming and nice during the whole process. I, I, I feel a bit challenged to have to speak. I was challenged from the start, and after these two wonderful speeches, I'm a bit more challenged. And I will do a different approach, actually. Um, instead of Lucas's, Fabi's, Adriano's uh, talks that are more, more, I think, connected to their practices and things that are related with activism and, and things that are happening right now in Brazil, what I will do is try to make a question about the meaning of these uprisings in the country and for that, I would like to relate a bit to the concept of crowds, to some theoreticians that thought about it, uh, and also a little bit to the recent, but not so recent history of Brazil to give also a background that I'm hoping will also help a non-local audience to get more input and information that give deeper, deep, more deep understanding of what's going on in the country at the moment. And I want to give special thanks for Tatiana that incentivated me a bit to put more Brazilian theory into the talk, uh, which I did, and I, I mean, I think I will lose some aspects, but win a lot with that. Um, but that's also to, to say that I did minor final adjustments, so this will be also more improvisational than I wished. <laughs> and the first thing that I'm going to, to address here is, I, I think, a um, reaction to the very nice conversations that we had in the email preparation for this talk, and is the necessity to somehow rearrange concepts when it, we think about phenomena that are embedded into local opposed to global situations and contexts. Um, I know that we are dealing with a lot of post words like post-digital, post-self, and all these kind of things. And, and, and that made me also realize that we are, in a way, talking about a post-globalization moment. And, and for Brazil, this has a very important meaning, I think, because unlike other countries, um, in Brazil, this, this process of globalization has a lot of bad sides, but also mean the end of the military dictatorship. So it's something that has to be read with signs that are only possible if you understand a bit of the local context also. Um, but I'm going to go even a little bit um, back in, in this story. And I want to take some quotes from a, an article by Octavio Iani, who is one of the important sociologists in the country. And, and he did this uh, very huge effort to sum up what are the important vectors of Brazilian social studies thinking about the country itself. And, and I'm lost with my notes here, actually, but I can't remember that without them. Uh, but he gives four trends. So the first one is an indebtedness to colonialism. So he thinks Brazilian thinking 
Um, even a long time after colonial, uh, more explicit polit political structure, still has this sort of colonial attitude embedded into that. Um, the other thing that he mentions is related to the thought of Sergio Buarque de Holanda, uh, who wrote this book called The Roots of Brazil, and is the, it is the idea that the country is a racial democracy, so this myth of a racial democracy would be another important thing as well. And underneath it, there is the assumption that Brazil is actually a place that does not have so many economical or social ten tensions as the result of a more crossbred or mixed or hybrid people, which we are clearly seeing here that it's just a myth, but he considers that to be one of the important structural thoughts about Brazil also. The other thing that he mentions is this idea of docility, which was coined in a, in a book, I think, by Gilberto Freire called uh, Casa Grande and Senzala. I don't really know how to translate that. Uh, but is the, well, in a lot of other, he mentions Paulo pa Prado, he mentioned a lot of other uh, different authors that deal with the idea. But what is beneath that is the, the assumption that Brazil is a country where people do not fight against the establishment. And this will be very important in the evolution of my talk here because this is one of the things that I think that are changing in the country in the moment. Um, but this is based on the description of historical facts that were important in the country and that he names as white revolutions. So for him, this idea of docility has as a result the fact that Brazilian has all these changes through these white revolutions which are sort of agreements between society and not really clashes or other things. And, um, and also I think another important thing as background that we, sh we should be aware of um, is that this period of post-globalization in Brazil is a moment of, um, I think, contrary to other countries. It's a moment where the country got stable, finally. So from the 80s on, there was no more inflation, and the economical situation in the country got really better for a number of people. And even some authors considered that as an economic preparation to a lot of the social reforms that are being made by the Labour Party. So there is this idea that it was necessary to have this economical stability to allow society to be in a position where it would be possible to go to the second next step to, uh, of social reforming. And, and even one of them has this challenging idea that the third step after that would be institutional reform. So Brazil would probably be going for three steps, economical stability, social reforms, and the need of uh, institutional reforms. Uh, I think this is a lot related with corruption and how it's being questioned, and I think this is in a way, it caught me as a visionary idea somehow, because it, even if it's a 79 sociology study, I think it foreveals the future of what's going on in the country for me a little bit. But what's happening uh, on side of that is also that the country is getting way, way more expensive than it was. So this is just one quick example, but it's the price of the square meter in an average, and you can see that it's more than three times higher in the last 10 years. And I think this is uh, just an indication, but the feeling of people is even worse than that. Um, so one, one uh, assumption that I'm trying to take out of that 
is that this mixture of a society that is somehow improving, somehow uh, running away from this dictatorship in very precarious moments, so with better economy, with more social conditions, mixed with the rays of insatisfaction resulted uh, of things like this big raise of prices and etc. is probably the fuel for ungeneralized unsatisfaction. Um, and I think this is interesting also because um, I, th I think the, the issue of the address, the protests in Brazil, it should be addressed keeping in mind that this is a um, very particular situation. It has to do with uh, radical reshaping of geopolitical <laughs> um, um, scenarios. But uh, so it's very uh, embedded in things like the Arab Spring or the Occupy movement. I think there's a lot of relations with that. Uh, but also it's very particular and, and um, has a lot of also a, a lot of, of local things that has to be understood only out of local contexts. So I'm going to skip a lot of things because I see that I have five minutes here. One of them would be this relation of the anthropophagy and the <laughs> French culture that that um, Oliver already mentioned, and this is where I should start actually, So, but it's ending. <laughs> so I'll sum it up uh, very fast in the following way. If you go through these authors that discuss the concept of crowds, such as Gustave Le Bon, Elias Canet, Freud, uh, more recent ones such as Hacking Bay, Clifford Stott, one thing that you infer out of it is that the very idea of a grouping is changing throughout history. And to, to address just a very important point that I want to make, the, the main thing about it is the disappearance of leaderships. So older concepts of crowd are more dependent on a leader that centralizes or drives the, mo the multitude, whereas newer examples, they are more, more um, based on ideas. So for that reason, they can be more heterogeneous, more even sometimes confrontational within itself. But I think this represents some sort of, of a more mature stage of the crowds, I would say, because there's no need of a leader anymore. <laughs> ideas and even divergent ideas within the same contest, they are already in, uh, enough. Um, you can get that if you go in details from um, how the... the um, crowd situation evolved uh, when you get through examples that Canetti uses and others. And what I want to point is just this idea that there is a very remarkable thing that happened in May 60, 60, in May 68. I think this is kind of a changing moment. Um, and one point that I want to make here also is that if you get the protests in Brazil as an example, it seems that in Brazil there is a very concentrated but similar process. Um, so some of the examples there are sort of a very short remake of this trajectory, you can identify characteristics that were, for example, common in the German Revolution of 1848, something that happened in Brazil a lot after. Uh, you can have moments that are equivalent, equivalent to May 68 uh, in occurrences in Brazil that happened also a lot after. And so my, my closing statement here would be that the country is probably passing uh, for a lot of things 
that happened in capitalist, in other capitalist societies way before. Uh, so in a way, it's a delay, but there is a good aspect of that delay because it's very concentrated, fast, and also it does not resulted in a very um, well modernism or a lot of the things that that. Uh, took us to the situation that led to Occupy or these other uprisings are not so so so, so strong in Brazil. So it's um, um, somehow there are good and bad sides of this delayed situation. Um, I think this can be seen a little bit in the outcomes of the protests against the tax fairs in Sao Paulo. Um, which is somehow the equivalent of, the, of some of the things that Adriano showed here. But what I'm really going to use as a final statement here is this phenomenon of the Holesinhos, because it is repeating something that happened before. Um, this, is, um, this is a sort of flash mob that, that people from outskirts of Sao Paulo are doing in shopping malls. And it's a result of a lack of entertainment opportunities. They just create a Facebook group and invite a lot of people to go to the mall and, and make sort of like a party there. And they do not do. They don't do any political claims about it. It's just for fun. But similarly, as what happened with the SP protests, I will wrap up. Um, <coughs> After repression, it seems that there was a systematic reaction of society, and that reaction was political. In the protests last year, this was the outcome of repression. And with Holesinhos, that's also the outcome of repression. So my final statement here would be that this does not seem to be anymore the case of a society that has colonialism, colonialism or docility embedded within it as a, as a sort of structuring characteristic. So that's my main point, actually. It seems that in Brazil things happened very late, but it looks like the country is in a moment where it is finally reversing this very important colonial or docile structure that rule for a long, for a long time. And with that, I leave the word back to Oliver, and thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. And um, excuse us again, like we put the speakers in a very difficult situation, because as you see, this is all like separate worlds being presented in, in 20 minutes. And we are talking just to remind us uh, of a country which is kind of almost the size of Europe. Uh, so this really is, like we said in the beginning, a window opening very different views and a lot of threads that Carla will then tie together for you afterwards. Well, and we will continue to uh, thread in the discussion. So Lucas, you are you. Hello. the final. Well, uh, it's um, such a, a great, a big responsibility to be here on AKV debating things that are, as Mar Marcos wanted to say, yet difficult to fully understand uh, the current context in Brazil. Uh, I will try to face the perspective of art that was little discussed here yet, um, and this is, uh, can be a bit um, uh, tricky because art and social movements not always tie together. And so the, the idea is to shift a bit from the multitude to art and maybe back to multitude. Uh, a brief, uh, just a few words about my background. I have been uh, dealing with art pra practice since the late 80s, uh, sometimes uh, uh, trying to emphasize what's going on, like, like uh, directing festivals uh, since the early 90s, uh, may, mainly as a producer, sometimes uh, doing documentaries, some like uh, 
social-based documentaries, feature films, and sometimes doing uh, what what urges. Sometimes doing what uh, it's uh, it, it somehow pulses. And mainly, I do audiovisual uh, work with with images, technically technical based uh, uh, images mediated by cameras. And most of these projects are motivated less by the wish to represent something, and more by the wish to learn a context, to be transformed, and maybe trigger something, if it's an individual level, but that can later be spread out. Uh, these are examples of a, a couple of feature films, documentary I did in many, in, in this one in, in almost 40 cities in Brazil about jobs that are disappearing. This one is about conflicts on prospects and, uh, and between Brazil and French Guiana, uh, uh, such a big issue, more or less what happens uh, in between Mexico and United States uh, along the border be between Brazil and French Guiana on the Oyapoque River, where there are some indigenous issues as well. Um, a lot of uh, gold mining pros prospects uh, dealing with gold, more or less trying to connect with Fabian, what Fabiani mentioned at the beginning, uh, the uh, shawar and the, the connection of gold and, and, and exploitation. Um, so, um, this idea of this practice are uh, always dealing with mediation techniques, but always trying to alleviate this, this tool, this apparatus for mediation. So, then we are here with this theme on uh, suggested uh, to talk about micropolitics of post-digital. I'd like to go uh, topic by topic, trying to comment my experience in relation with that. Okay, uh, the pre-digital, what is post-digital? So it means that it was a pre-digital and a digital age. Uh, I'd like to bridge this idea that uh, pre-digital, late 80s, Guattari, Felix Guattari was quite uh, well known in Brazil because he was following uh, the emergence of, of Workers' Party. And there was um, a book released together with uh, a psychoanalyst, Sueli Honik, called Micropolitics, Micropolitica, and which was part of my background by that time. Uh, this assertion by, by Guattari, capital is a semiotic operator. I think it still serves today to fully understand, not, not to fully, but to better understand uh, this new um, age of the capitalism today, which is uh, somehow uh, tied to this idea of multitude. Um, which I try to, to do in a, in a few moments. Uh, so the digital, what was the digital? I, um, I come from a generation that experienced the, the, the transition from the, the pre-digital to digital and trying to understand what can be this, this post-digital. But through uh, this post-digital thing, uh, uh, suggest that the digital was sort of, of a utopia, uh, an euphoria, a bubble thing, something that, that was emergent and uh, a lot of artists or um, uh, there was a context in, in which people were engaged on so much on, the, on digital solutions, on digital realm. And if we, if we talk about this afterglow, we can, uh, I think it, uh, one might be suggested that there was this kind of euphoria once. Um, and this idea of post-digital, uh, also, it might sound also as an utopia, that would, would uh, break this, this dialogic systems, these dialectical systems, and undivide, undivide global and local, undivide virtual and real, political and private, and towards something that could somehow uh, be some alternative, uh, alternative use of technology, art, and cultural exchange. So not 
separating each other, but some maybe merging them. Uh, this utopia or this current uh, belief could be sort of uh, an ecology of technical and non-technological and non-technical resource. Um, should it be or not? I'm not sure yet. Uh, this. So uh, we are talking about uh, when you mention this uh, practice, art practice that deal with public life practice that is affected or affects social reality, uh, the first question is, which social reality is this? Which social reality we are talking about? Uh, in Brazil, uh, it has been more and more recently uh, described not as a crowd, but as a multitude. And it's impossible to not quote uh, Negri here, Negri and Hart, for, uh, for a sort of uh, translating the Marxist term, Marxist uh, concepts, to uh, some more recent ones. And, and this multitude uh, relating, relates to a for, for post fordist age uh, tied up under semiotic capitalism. The same notion that Guattari um, suggested us on the, the 80s. Uh, a crowd recognized not only by its homogeneity, but recognized by the singularity of each of, of its component. In other words, also tied by consumerism, a crowd being better described uh, as uh, potential consumers, potential um, uh, individuals that that are related to each other under the pressure of, of the semiotic capitalism. And this has been evolved since, uh, uh, since uh, the protests that Marcus introduced, like for example, in May 68, which is still relates to an idea of crowd. The same, this image that shows uh, the carnival in Salvador, in Bahia, uh, millions of people, that would be also a crowd, a crowd that, that is, is tied un under this, uh, what, what Freud described as the um, uh, oceanic, oceanic uh, feeling, that one relates to each other by sharing a common experience, a sort of shamanic experience. But so it's, it's not the multitude we are talking, we are foreseeing in, in the more recent uh, uh, facts in Brazil. This is also the gay parade, gay, there's also another crowd, a gay parade in Sao Paulo who uh, quickly became the, the biggest in the world, like uh, um, putting together two to three millions of inhabitants in, uh, uh, in the, the, the main, uh, Paulista Avenue in Sao Paulo. And just recent, now last July, uh, three millions of people just in Copacabana Beach uh, because of the Pope, the Francisco Pope, the Argentinian Pope in, in Brazil. Again, this is more towards this oceanic feeling that Freud described as a as a need to share or to look for happiness, to look for a, 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 a relief of, of tensions. And so this is not what really interests in social movements. It's not the trance, it's maybe the feeling that one can share something that it's more uh, after some conflict. So it's impossible, um, here, uh, here is this, uh, so how it, it, it's linked to this idea of, of micropolitics. Um, uh, this is the book I mentioned by Guattari and Sueli Honik, the Brazilian psychoanalyst, Sueli Honik. And they were quite, um, quite uh, pioneering on explaining this, this idea of singularity that we later find on empire by, by, uh, by Tony Negri. Uh, Sueli Honik described this singularity among, uh, this feeling of singularity in the multitude um, by, um, 
uh, since the, the, the 80s and in a, in a, um, in a book, uh, Chaos and Order, uh, she described uh, it uh, more or less in the same words that Negri described a year ago, a year later in, at Empire. Um, then there was a l several literatures on that, uh, trying to understand uh, the nature of these new groups, new agglomerations, new, new crowds, what these crowds have in, uh, in common with the current time. Um, if you see, if you if the ones, for the ones who participated on, on the protests in, uh, in June last year in Sao Paulo and other cities, one would get the feeling that we are among a supermarket of ideologies. Um, there will be people carrying banners on the, your side that would will feel a bit contradictory. Um, so this feeling is quite harsh, for example, uh, quite hard. For example, I was on the streets and looking to my side, there was some, some advertisers uh, claiming for free commerce, free market, neoliberal in its worst uh, version. And this, this was uh, quite a, 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 a constraint for understanding this. So this is not crowd anymore, definitely. This is more, this is something else. Not sure if it really is related to exactly what Negri describes, but it's something, something that we are yet to understand. Well, and then picking another part of, the, of our theme now, we come to transitional space. Um, transitional, what, what is it? What, what is it transitional? Uh, it can be a passage from one subject to another in discourse. It can be a word, a phrase, a linked sen sentence. It can be a heterotopy as described by Foucault. It can be many things. It can be uh, uh, some it can relate to some projects, art projects, that somehow starts a feeling that, uh, well, sociology or uh, philosophy uh, doesn't really count on subjectivity sometimes. The way we appreciate some artwork or we understand in our feelings and sometimes the lack of words for, for something. Um, it can be also what Marcus mentioned, some, the idea of temporary autonomous zone as described by Hacking Bay. So uh, it can be some projects like uh, we deal, uh, together with my colleague Gisela Domsky, we started a project trying to, to, ta to, to deal with issues of mobility in Sao Paulo, trying to create uh, poss poss possibilities for and uh, dealing with the public space and bringing artworks for the out outskirts of Sao Paulo. This Lab Movil project is going on uh, since 2012, and we have a series of workshops running next week in, in, s in different cities, in, always in outskirts, always uh, uh, avoiding the mainstream thing. Okay, transitional space can be a task, as I mentioned, can be a terotopies, and can be arts also. Maybe uh, transitional space are uh, better fit on, on the, the idea of art. This is, for example, the same year that was happening this, uh, a protest in 68, this artist, Ligia Papi, was doing this performance, um, uh, tying up people with a huge, uh, sheet of uh, with his sheet, uh, and it's quite symbolic uh, to today to understand this, the context. It can be uh, an image by this American photographer Wiggy that <laughs> uh, Oliver introduced me a few days ago. It can be um, a piece, a work of Lorival Coquinha, uh, which is. Um, clothes linked um, on, uh, along the river in Recife, uh, 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 
clothes that belongs to people living on that area. It can be the actions by etc. group, an Argentinian group of activists uh, trying to make something uh, more or less like theater or more or less like this electronic disturbance theater or Augusto Boal. Uh, it can be works like this Argentinian one called Multitude. This work is done in 2008 by Gabriela Golder. Uh, it's a very slow motion shot of people trying to grab food in, in a crisis time in Buenos Aires. And slowly it goes, uh, it shows the, the, the really hard feeling that's behind that. It can be a Kutlu Gataman project, can be another piece called Multitude from Argentina. Uh, it can be many different works, uh, like uh, Chino Segal did in Tate Modern, or what um, uh, Himini Protocol did in Berlin uh, with this, this series of works called 100% uh, Berlin, 100% uh, Melbourne, 100% New York, and they are going to do this in Sao Paulo, 100% Sao Paulo. Actually, I'm curating a show in Sao Paulo for April, which is called Multitude. So I have a big collection of, of works that can fit on this idea, including um, works that I have been producing since 2006 under the word multitude. Of course, my work will not be on my exhibition, but uh, I, uh, I'm careful about that. But uh, it, I would try to just show a bit um, how it, it constitutes. It started from this image by uh, Giuseppe da Volpetto, an, um, a painter um, who has this painting that uh, uh, it was used in Novecento, filmed by Bertolucci, uh, this idea of the, the, the campesinos, the, the um, workers on the farms, coming to the city and saying, well, we are, want to be part of the power. We want to, to, to have opinion on what's going on. And I did this work uh, inviting people uh, living around uh, a place, uh, uh, an exhibition space, it was a uh, place uh, called Sesc in Sao Paulo, but people who does, doesn't really feel that they are, that they can be, they can uh, go inside the gallery. So I invited them to do a shot uh, as if they were inside the gallery. Uh, so it's, um, when I was Trying to do, to do this work, I, I, I asked people, do you go to this gallery? Do, do you know what happens there? They said, no, I work here for 10 years. I have never been there because it seems that it's too posh, it's too elegant, I cannot be inside that. And then what I did was to project on the, on this, on this, this wall, this, this glass, well, glass, a projection, large-scale projection of almost 20 meters, uh, bringing people that work around there. And it ended up by that those people, they don't l really live there. They are, um, they, uh, they are mostly uh, from a, 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 a few families of Pancararu indigenous people living in a favela that was, uh, has been renovated in Sao Paulo. It's, it's interesting that those guys living on, um, working on, around this, this place are actually uh, indigenous people uh, or with an uh, origin. Wow. Okay. Uh, so this idea of multitude has been, I have been doing several versions, editions of this in many, uh, many places, sometimes assembling this mural paintings such as uh, Diego Rivera one uh, in Mexico, in the favela of Rio de Janeiro, Maré, uh, always uh, uh, reenacting a different thing, sometimes facing the audience, asking, what are you doing here? What do you want from us? What are you, uh, f why are you are facing this? So this, um, just to get the last uh, slide, 
uh, the street protests. So we ended up with the street protests, and the street protests has a lot of contradictions, a lot of uh, issues difficult to understand. And the latest one is this um, uh, thing uh, that are uh, the fact that is driven most of the recent manif manifestations that I have seen that Marcos mentioned, Rolezinhos, are totally driven by consumerism. Uh, and the consumerism is something also that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, this is a, a, a very interesting author dealing with that, an Argentinian, uh, Nestor Garcia Canclini. And he, this is the last two slides, uh, he, he claims that this participation on social life has been more and more driven by consumerism. And that's exactly what has been going on with the Rolezin, which is a manifest people going to shopping malls and not really trying to, not really disturbing by doing, but, but having fun, going there for entertainment. And they are belonging to this uh, infamous class C, D or E. Uh, this is an artist who just did a work painting, uh, be aware or, or watch out or uh, uh, keep, watch, uh, keep watch the C class, be aware. Uh, and this, this piece was, got a prize instantly. <laughs> it's just a painting on the wall, like we watch of the class C. And uh, so this has done with part of this thing uh, I'll just show a video, 30 seconds of a video, showing what this, this uh, rolezinho means. Uh, they go to shopping malls, uh, but they, they, look, they don't look like the other consumers. So the police and the, the shoppers uh, start to be afraid of what they do. I need sound. The video needs sounds. There was sound. Yeah. And so it was just recent, but a few, a few weeks or maybe a week before Christmas, um, when people are really willing to consume, the shoppers are really, really willing to sell. And so it started uh, as a really mass, massive thing. Uh, thousands of people going to supermarkets, to, to shopping malls, and trying to, to sometimes just listen to funk music. <laughs> and this is quite embarrassing. Okay, I'll leave this. Uh, I'll leave this for without sound, and maybe yeah. Oliver can wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Lucas. I, I promised him he, he would get... Thanks, yeah. Thank so I, I promised him some more minutes because he brought me some café from Brazil. <laughs> this is the reason. But also, I, I was very thankful because I think, uh, as, as we noticed, uh, we've been brought shamanism through the back door here. Uh, and in, in this way, this was an, a nice circle. Uh, often appears unexpected places. Uh, we might talk about that. Um, I'll donate my minutes for, uh, for the discussion later because I think that uh, makes more sense. Just want to say w one thing in, 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 in a first reaction to, to these different but kind of knitted presentations. That is that I would like from my perspective and my interest in, in this dialogue also to take up what Lucas was sketching in terms of bringing up the horizon of micropolitics and linking it to the question of transition. Um, because like for me, what is interesting in that is in, in all these examples, the differences and the commonalities of course, like you brought with Guatari, I think you showed like how these, how our discourses are really interweaved from, from very early on. Um, but for me, what, what was also showing up is the question of what does social change mean really? in the end, like what conceptions, what ideas, what trajectories of uh, 
social transition are inscribed in these, uh, in these formations that you showed, in these different ones, but also in the concept of the multitude itself, which you so nicely tied in with questions of semiotic capital and, uh, and transition itself. So the one who has the awkward but also rewarding task to reap all the benefits and bring it all together is Carla Brunet. Uh, you're welcome. And I want to especially welcome her not only to, to face up to this task, but also as one of the co-organizers of the very event that we were starting off with here, which is Stropixel, uh, of which one part was in Ruiz de Fora, if I pronounced that right, and Carla was co-organizing that. So it's very fitting that she would have the right to tie this together. Uh, good afternoon, and I promise I'll be very brief. <laughs> First, uh, I just want to start with some, a little point that uh, Marco said that I think it's interesting to give a little context and I really like that idea. He was talking about Ottaviani and he was saying about the kind of docility, that's the word you used, uh, about Brazil. And that comes from, uh, because in 64 we got a, started a dictatorship in Brazil and it was the easy one in Latin America because there was no revolution, there was no war and suddenly the military took over. There is a famous saying of an American poet, poet that was living in Brazil and she said, the military took over in the evening and next morning people were playing soccer on the beach. So because of this situation, we are none in Brazil when we have this kind of uh, esteem that we are very docile and very nice because we had a dictatorship and we, people kept living the way they were doing and as nothing happened. And we are all here, we were born during that period because it was for 20 years in Brazil, even a little bit more, depends on how you connect. And it's interesting also, all the, all the, the talks that they gave, you can see the connection of the movements and this, almost all the movements they said was the last year, like 2013. Starting with what uh, Fabiano was, was saying, was Brazil is very social and people are very into social networks. And it was very interesting to see uh, kind of even touching when you see everybody changing their names and uh, even people that you never thought of and changing their names and saying they were also uh, uh, Guarani Kaiwa. But then the same people, next day they were putting their photos uh, uh, with the Coca-Cola can with their name. So it was, that's something very paradoxical about the Brazilian protest because people were protesting about the indigenous or about uh, Aldeia uh, Maracanã and they at the same time they are uh, doing very interesting, they are supporting the brands, they are supporting the World Cup. But for me, the last year was very touching in a way in terms of protests and not being docile because I hate that kind of docility. I don't want to, like, because I don't like the idea that Brazilians are always sweet and then when you're sweet, you don't protest or you don't uh, fight for your rights. So that's good that we are kind of changing that. And for me as a Brazilian, it was very interesting to see the first time in my life that people protest against soccer because the big thing in Brazil is soccer and carnival. And it's the same year, soccer, World Cup is together with the year of the election for president. So it's always in a way manipulated soccer. And also carnival, for example, when, when I was a teenager, we went to carnival and then when we come back, the government had taken all the money from everybody's account after the four years of carnival. And these things happen in Brazil in these periods. So it was interesting because of the Confederation uh, Cup last year, they start protesting. But we saw all these protests, all what uh, uh, Adriano was showing also, it's not gonna be a World Cup. I wish we could be, a, it's gonna be a different World Cup, not the one that FIFA wants or the, the uh, big companies want. But I, I wish we could be more optimistic as that, but I think this is gonna be a very kind of dark year in Brazil because of the gentrification they are doing, all the cities. And even though we had a lot of protests and I think that will happen a lot this year, doesn't change anything, you know, like it's, we are having our voice there, but we are tied. Doesn't change too much in the end. I don't see any change. Things are still going as Fabi was saying like didn't change anything of the rules for the 
uh, indigenous or for the Yanomamis or so it's really hard to know where what should we do to change it's like what's the point maybe art like uh, Lucas was finishing with art maybe if you touch people with art or I don't know so it's kind of a question no it, it's good that we are not being docile anymore but how to change and how to make this year not that World Cup that's supposed to be. It's kind of, it's just a way to think. Yeah, thanks, Carla. I think this is an open invitation to everyone thinking about change, being non-docile or whatever. I don't know where the microphones are. Do we have some? Yeah. Can, can you use? Oh, that's funny. Okay, I just want to say one thing that no one mentioned about the Holezinho, that uh, Holezinho uh, was something that young people were doing in Brazil, and it's not political at all, and it's not even a, a, a kind of a protest in posh malls. They just are bored teenagers in a city like Sao Paulo that has nothing to do, and they spend the whole day on social medias, and they want to meet. And then it turns into something else that it's not the point here, just no one mentioned that. I, I, I was just wondering because uh, Brazil, uh, be kind of Brazilians are very social, and the social media is a big thing in Brazil. And everything is on YouTube. You can see all these crazy uh, videos about everyday life in all the different parts of Brazil. And uh, how this process from being online, like in whole things, they just go and go to the malls, but that turned into something bigger, that were the protests that were all over Brazil. And uh, even when we don't have the, the results, uh, I think being uh, in the media and people were getting exposed to that is, uh, is something positive. So I want, you, I want to know your opinion about how this comes from like uh, digital to reality, how people just uh, stop just talking stuff on the internet that could be important stuff or important stuff to go and actually do some, something and, and uh, go into the streets and mobilizing. Okay, Lucas will respond to that at least, some, some more, Marcus. My proposal though is because we have just these 10 minutes left and we made a promise uh, because of the following event that we collect the questions and then we have okay. kind of collective reaction because What's you seem to... No, I, I just... I just I would first ask the questions, all of them, and then we have one round. Actually, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. And I, to, I think Fabiana, who made the last comments, the wrap up, uh, where you said, um, I don't know how those things are going to change, where we are going to. And I think, uh, well, from everything you exposed, made me think that uh, Brazil is right now uh, in Brazilians uh, on a period of awareness, and awareness takes time, and it's a very positive, I think it's a very positive um, evolution or trend to, um, to fight back uh, this icon, cultural icon of football, uh, right now with the World Cup. I think it's a very a positive, uh, um, trend or positive awareness and I just would like to mention here um, Terence McKenna who said culture is not your friend and just for you to think about it <laughs> thank you very much okay are there more comments or questions uh, just a uh, yeah, question uh, mostly to Fabiana, um, because we didn't get a, really a perspective of your idea of techno-shamanism. And um, because, because I'm a little bit dubious about the fact that we're going to get the indigenous perspective by playing with our, our technologies in this world. And so I'm really wondering what you mean by this hybrid techno-shamanism. Is it something... You're talking about using the internet in a, in a shamanistic way, or what exactly do you mean by that? Because I, I would really like to think of ways, whether it's like 
you know, experiencing ayahuasca or something, but really getting these indigenous perspectives that we're getting really detached from the deeper we go into these um, media immersive environments. Just very quickly, quickly, I want to clarify something out of his comment because I did not mean that, that the Holesinos were making political claims. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. But, but the thing is that how society reacted to repression of that by starting political Holesinos versions of that were not the original people, but a reaction to how police and how the shopping malls were dealing with these people. For me, this was a nice sign because it was related with how society also reacted to repression during the protests last year. So this is what gives me the impression that Brazil is being not docile anymore, becoming a society that is more ready to, to politically react to things. But, but I never claimed Holesinhos to be political in the... Well, and I, um, I totally ag uh, agree, not totally, almost ag agree, 100%, almost 100% I agree with you that it's, uh, it shouldn't even be mentioned here as, as a political approach, but uh, because it, at f first sight it is a political, consumer-minded, entertainment-driven, but in this new scene, in this new uh, uh, context of understanding the, the contradictions of multitude, uh, it is yet yeah, it, it is political. Uh, that, uh, it, it broke the, the idea of, of the leftists saying, some would say, this is very political, this is not political at all. These guys just want uh, new shoes. These guys just want to wanna have some place for entertainment. And this has been dividing a lot of, of, of uh, thinkers, leftists, and, and public opinion. Newspapers are somehow doing editorial towards one side, another side. I mentioned I, I wanted to, to keep the focus on these contradictions uh, at the end, and I failed because of the time, but uh, I, I showed a, a, a a book called The Rebel Cell is by two Canadians, and basically, they, they, this, according to this book, uh, they say that the counter-cultural movements have failed, and, and that they all, all share a common fatal error in the way that they understood society. Counterculture is not a treat to the system. They say that uh, just scratching the system would only make the system stronger. So what it can do, that's the point. I don't have an, any answer for that, but uh, I, I don't have a solution. I'm just uh, trying to point the contradictions that we are finding on the current uh, movements now. And what art, what is the role of art this? How art can relate with this concept? How does, it, uh, does this concept echo in this symbolic field? Uh, so this is a way to collaborate with an, a, uh, a critique on the idea of multitude. Uh, art can, can be just uh, another skin, another layer to understand that. Uh, because sometimes uh, the symbolic field is just out of the discussion. Just now. Okay, before uh, Fabi will have uh, the last word, which I think is fair on techno-shamanism, I uh, want to hereby kind of log out and thank everyone. I think this discussion is one to be continued. I hope we, we, we kind of made visible a context of discussion which, as, as you hopefully sensed, has been going on for a while and which will continue. I think this question of consumerism is one we, we should take up because it, it has come up in different discussions. It would be interesting now, for example, to discuss the European experience of that, like some people maybe have thought of Yo Mango with, with uh, these scenes in the shopping malls. Also the Blackberry riots are a case in point, like people robbing for, officially, like 
labeled robbers for taking part in, in con consumer culture. So this is all to be postponed, con uh, continued in other spaces. Fabi, you might bring us the light on techno-shamanism at the end now of this panel. Okay, it's, it's, uh, uh, first it's a challenge and it's a problem, it's our problem because one kind of word is dying, yeah? And then maybe it's exactly these indigenous where you suspect we will never take their point of view, their perspective. Because um, I think when uh, we work with Haki Day, for instance, uh, I got a bit uh, surprised on Haki Day instance because we had so many things to do, so fast, so organized, so full of uh, rules and uh, regras, how do you say? Rules. And uh, in the end, you see all this, that presentations, but the process is not there, yeah? The people are not doing the process. The things are stuck it for, from, from it. I think this is a worst way to do a hockey, a, anything with a hockey lab or hockey day or techno shamanism. Because f first, because you need to be in process. Second, because you need to have a, rela a real relation with things. Yeah, in, in uh, techno shamanism is uh, can be as well. I remember now very very fast. I'm thinking very fast. Uh, <laughs> Again, yeah, like in Hack Day, very fast, very fast all the time. And then, now I need to think fast about um, Johnny. Uh, Johnny camped with someone who uh, already came here to Transmediale. Tatiana knows him very well. Uh, and I think he has one of the most beautiful work of techno shamanism for me. Because he, give, he, he is very ethical, he's not esoteric. Me neither, Adriano neither. But uh, this idea about the ritual, to make the things with their, their time, to connect uh, things, to connect with the matter, I think he does this in his work, and because that I'm so fan of this work of him, he just make this garimpo, gold mining of uh, loads of hardwares in a group, yeah? So we do like two, three days this, Taking all the process, learning, separating the gold, separating the, the silver and everything. And then after the process of purify it, then in the end, when it's red, we drink it with pur very purified. Sometimes it doesn't work. This is Haki Lab as well. Almost of the time it doesn't work, but the idea is making the appropriation of some knowledge and the entering contact with something. Yeah? with this matter, with the subjectivity of this matter. matter. And, 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 and it's beautiful when the people drink the gold because you incorporate a process. And then in the end, he, put in the, he give it back to the soil, the rest of this gold. It's a symbolic work, uh, it's a conceptual work, but it has, there is this practice as well, and resolve so many problems, like uh, re, um, resolve our tragedy in a, 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 a beautiful way. So, for resume, if I could say what techno shamanism is, is connect um, the process of um, working with a, with a, with a machines, respecting the 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 like indigenous people do, the subjectivity of this matter and trying to open our fucking white brains, mind for, uh, to, to, to be, well, more, more interesting, okay? Okay. Thanks everyone for making the effort. Um, so, yeah, thanks for diving with us into Shamanism Multitude uh, Brazil, this common discussion. Hope to see you again uh, in the event uh, how to circumvent the panopticum. I think it also relates to what Adriano said, the role of whistleblowing to actually create openness in these uh, super complex but very uh, controlled world. Um, and I hope we continue this discussion and hopefully we'll meet again. How much?
Ten, ten. <laughs>